Hi, I'm Joshua Keep. And I'm Michelle Keep. We're erotica authors, as you well know. And smut peddlers. Purveyors of awesome sci fi and fantasy filth. We write twisted romances. And epic adventures. So, this is our first podcast, and we'll be talking about the genres we love, our website, Darkness Fantasy Erotica, and responding to fan questions. Okay, uh, we first started writing together uh, over a decade ago. Uh, we met on the internet back when, you know, uh, if you met someone on the internet, you were accused of being a uh, serial killer. This was back in the days of AOL Instant Messenger, when it was really big. Sad to say. <laughs> and so, having met on the internet, you know, communicating through written text was a big thing for us. And so, we started out, when I was in university, uh, sending dirty letters to my lovely Michelle. They were pretty dirty, but... Um... We didn't actually move on until into fiction until we started playing World of Warcraft, which was back in like 2005 or something. That is not true. Many of the letters were fictional stories. They were fictional stories about us. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> so, depending on your idea of what fictional is, we either started a decade ago or like Seven years or something. I think you're being very, uh... I mean, come on, it was made up. It wasn't real, it's fiction. <laughs> I what think I you... recall one was about your fantasy of having sex with me in the snow. Right, yes. Yeah, there was... Definitely fiction. <laughs> Only because we now hate snow, because we're big buddy duddies for winter. The idea of getting you to go have sex in the snow when I, like, in the winter here, we need to have the heat cranked up. I like warm things. I do not deny this. <laughs> so, anyways, the first fictional story that I actually wrote, I wrote at work. And um, what happened was I've always been very keen at work to actually do work. So when I was told at this one place that they didn't like that, they wanted you to look busy rather than to be busy or to ask questions like if you wanted work to do. So I got called into this disciplinary meeting because I kept asking for work and they kept saying, well, we don't have the work to give you, so we need you to look busy. So I started writing erotica at work. And the first story I wrote was actually a solo female masturbation story. And I wrote that as a present for Josh because I thought it was a pretty cool idea. And uh, another big benefit was your performance reviews at work went way up after that. And they you looked very, very busy. They were impressed with me. They, they kept telling everybody how much my work ethic had improved. It was, uh, it was great. So that's actually when we started um, publishing our stuff on a website. We actually had a friend in World of Warcraft who offered to host our stories for us. And uh, so he hosted us for probably the first six months or so, and then we bought our own host. And then that kind of snowballed into over a 100 World of Warcraft stories. Um, something like that. Something, yeah, around that. And then last year, well, probably two years ago, we quit WoW, and we started writing original fiction. Um, we both love reading, and we both kept reading all of these, like, stories. At the time, we were really big into the Dungeons & Dragons uh, Forgotten Realms books, so we started reading all these stories, and we loved them. We thought they were really interesting, and had really great characters, and really great, um, lore and history and background and it had like no sex so that there was obviously... often sex to be fair well there it was, was just... sex but it was not explicit i mean yes they could spend like 20 pages describing how this man danced with his sword in combat but yeah when it came to a sex scene it was a fade dodge, to black parry dance dance dodge yeah so we got um really interested in that and we started writing for our own characters 
and uh, creating our own um, big epic worlds. And that's actually where uh, we got started with, um, I think, Lila and Glaricos were our first. Yeah. So they are our, he's half demon and she's half demon, but she looks half angel. <laughs> so um, we followed their, it, it's more of an adventure story than anything, but there's a lot of sex because they're both, you know, demons and they're both hyper sexualized and everything and they just like sex it's a part of their life and you know we spent as much time on that as we did with any of the fight scenes so um yeah that was a big deal we wrote quite a lot for them uh i think like probably works out to geez uh, even four novels worth easily of material on them that we are still going through editing and bringing up, uh, revising, trying to turn it into something of our own entirely, which we've done, but it still needs a lot of editing and work, and we plan to start releasing it soon-ish. Yeah. Since, it, since it was our first um, really big world and our really big piece of uh, writing after stopping with fan fiction, um, it's needed a lot more work than like our recent pieces. Uh, we've kind of streamlined our process quite a lot and we write and, um, edit a lot more efficiently now. But back then we, uh, we were just writing for each other and writing for our fans. So, um, we didn't even think of publishing at that time. So, no. Yeah. It, it was just a completely different, um, style of writing than what we think would be published worthy. So well, being a writer was something, uh, you know, rich people who didn't have to worry about making a living could do, or those crazy people at work that, that you know, so like, well, I'm a writer, and well, what have you written? Well, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> um, there's one scene in uh, the werewolf film that MST3K uh, riffs on. Um, if you guys follow me on Twitter, you know I love MST3K. We watch it all the time. So one of the characters is a writer, and he goes up to one of the other characters and introduces himself. He's like, so, I'm a writer. And she goes, oh, really? It's like, yeah, I'm actually working on something right now. <laughs> and that's kind of the mentality of, um, you know, what we always figured writers were. we been writing ever since we were kids like I was in all of these um, writing classes creative writing classes when I was going through high school I was entered in all of these writing contests but that was always something that you never quit your day job over it's always something that you do for fun and you struggle right. for years and years and years to maybe get published with like one of the big names and because of the topics that we like where we like explicit sex and we like twisted romances and we like we like dark themes. Yeah, we have a lot of really dark themes. And I mean, those themes are fine as long as you're not marketing it as erotica. But the second you tie in the fact that, yes, we consider it erotic and we consider it erotica, um, a lot of publishers have trouble mixing certain themes. Um, so there was pretty much no real hope in either of our minds that we'd find a publisher that would be interested in our work and that would be able to um, get us the reader base that we felt we could get on our own. Never considered it, really. Yeah. It was something written off, in my mind, before the question could even be raised. Yeah. So um, then we started thinking about, well, maybe we should uh, put some of our stuff on our website and we could have people donate. And we could tell them that if they donate um, quickly, or if they donate a lot, then we'll release things faster. It'd be a way of us making some income off of it and helping our fans get more of our stuff edited faster. Because obviously it takes a lot of time and energy and effort and money in order to edit and get stuff available for people. So we thought if people were responding to it, then they could you know, kind of do this donation campaign and it'd be great. Right. Yeah, that was initial the initial idea we had because our website, jmkeep.com, had, you know, had a, a sizable fan base for over the years just because of our fan fiction, you know, 
it seemed like a reasonable idea. Uh, however, as we were going about setting that up, something, of course, there had been, you know, underneath our noses, despite the big readers and writers we've been our entire lives, you know, the whole e-publishing thing had taken off big time. And we had never actually had e-readers. Um, we initially were the type of people that thought, okay, we like books. We like the smell of books. We were like Giles back in the first season of Buffy, where he's telling Jenny Callender that, no, he likes the smell of books and how they feel. And, you know, we were real into that. And then we looked around and realized we have bookshelves and bookshelves and bookshelves and boxes and boxes and boxes everywhere in our apartment. They are overflowing. And so we finally invested in tablets. And it just kind of consumed our lives for a while because it was so easy to get so many books and to just devour them. And I could bring my tablet to work and I could read whatever I want. I didn't have to plan ahead of time like, oh, what one do I want to read today? It was just I had everything at my fingertips. Right, yeah. It was such a huge convenience. It it converted us practically overnight from diehard old, you know, I love our paperbacks to what the hell have I been doing all these years? It's a very prospect now of having to move and take any of these books with us is just cringe inducing. So then we realized that ebooks are awesome and hey wait, there's actually people who are making money off this on their own who sell stuff that publishers wouldn't touch. I was finally able to get like a lot of really dark erotica and um this is stuff I couldn't find in the stores. I went to the store last year and I was searching everywhere for erotica. And I like we have an erotica section and it's not very big, but you know, it has some stuff. So I picked up a book called Taboo. And I'm like, well, you know, it has to be taboo with a name taboo. And there was so naive. Yeah, it <laughs> it was just not at all what I anticipated. It wasn't at all what I was expecting. And um it really made me realize how uh, different the standards of publishers are for me when it comes to taboo or dark erotica. Like, you know, having sex before marriage to me is not taboo. Um, <laughs> not for you and everybody else yeah, in existence like, for the most part. I know that a lot of people, like, still it's considered, like, menage is considered, like, this ultimate dirty taboo and, like, you know, it's still really hard to even find relationships that are not monogamous and are not, um, you know, really still boy meets girl, girl falls in love with boy, something happens to keep them apart, they overcome it together, and then they sail off into the sunset. Um, anything that strays from that is kind of deemed taboo or dark or dirty, but it's like, no, for me, like, I've read books where it's like the girl is kidnapped and then forced into a sexual relationship with, you know, her kidnapper. That's dark to me. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for something dark. So obviously there's different standards. Yeah, dramatically. Dramatically, <laughs> it, yeah. You know, uh, for those of us who have spent, you know, a large portion of our lives on the Internet and have gone there for, uh, you know, erotic or reading stories, I mean, you know that the culture of the internet uh, has really opened up a lot of people's minds to what is uh, acceptable, what is kinky. Like you go on to, uh, like like Michelle said, you know, this book that it considered such things that were so mundane to us, like just the idea of having a like sex toys was supposedly really taboo in this book. But you know. How mundane is that? Like, you know, for someone who's like been on the internet for the, you know, most of their lives and, you know, dealing with stories. I mean, like on our, on our uh, website, darknessfantasyerotica.com, it's like, you know, the stuff people write about there, I mean, it's so far beyond any of that. I mean, you know, some of the, like, you know, it runs the gamut from like, you know, traditional male on female, like romantic sex to like wild debauchery with violence, blood and, bestiality and <laughs> yeah. OV positions and like I remember when Josh first wrote me um, a gangbang story well a gang rape story and he posted it and 
they actually told him that there was no need to tag it as rape because, or like extreme rape, because this was just run of the mill. And that's pretty much what like all of the people online that I'm seeing, like all of these people who grew up reading fan fiction, all of these people who grew up on like fanfiction.net or darkness fantasy erotica or like hentai foundry like all of these sites have so much extreme kinks um stuff that's completely unfathomable in real life like it's just not possible people are reading about it and people love it and uh it's yeah. not touched in traditional publishing at all like i don't think they understand even what that is yeah traditional publishers are terrified of alienating their audience but you know the internet has shown that there's an audience for this stuff. People have realized that it's fantasy, that it's make believe, that, you know, it's not causing any of them to lose their minds and go to try to uh, reenact any of this. So they just enjoy it for the fantasy that it is. And I mean, that's like right now, Amazon is working on putting in a filter for um, erotic titles. And somebody mentioned on uh, the K boards the other day, they said, I don't understand why they're filtering uh, erotica as adult when they allow things like American Psycho to be sold to anyone. And it's just, there's still this idea that as soon as you try to eroticize something, it becomes wrong. It becomes something more likely to tempt people to evil. But I mean, I read um, one book, it was a horror book, and like, all it was, like, they detailed in one scene, um, a father raping a captive woman as she was bound and tortured in his basement, while his son watched and masturbated. And like, it wasn't like this was glossed over, it, it had a fair amount of detail. So the idea that that's fine, that you can torture and rape a woman while you're son masturbates because it's you know horror it's not meant to arouse but like there's still plenty of detail if somebody wanted to get aroused over it and if somebody was going to get aroused over it like it would be perfectly arousing um so the idea that that's fine but as soon as you call it erotica it's going to pervert your mind is just kind of really sick like i'd be far more afraid of somebody who you know, wanted to read horror stuff over erotic stuff. And, I mean, obviously I'm not because I know it's fantasy. (laughs) But if you're going to be afraid of anything, I'd rather people be afraid of murder and torture than, you know, sex. Well, yeah. But then, of course, as we've indicated, we involve a lot of dark themes. So we're certainly not taking pot shots at anybody else for what they're doing. Hell no. We write horror erotica, too. So, you know... We're, com- we're coming from the same place. Horotica is something of a uh, a fascination of ours. We've got a few titles out like that, so, you know. Yeah, like, um, Led Into Temptation is kind of a Cthulhu-y, like, Lovecraftian-inspired uh, erotica. And, you know, I'm sure people would think that it's pretty fucked up, and that's kind of what's arousing about it, is because it's it supposed is to be. Up. Yeah, exactly. Like, whenever you feel something strongly... Typically, you know, we're allowed, we're capable of fetishizing it. So, um, you know, it's not like it's a bad thing. It's just something that happens when you feel strongly about something. So, Right. So, I mean, we get a lot of inspiration for our writing from different places. Um, As I mentioned before, Dungeons & Dragons has been great for our fantasy um, settings and Lovecraft is great for our horror stuff, and World of Warcraft still kind of uh, influences us because we wrote it for so long, and we had such an attachment to our own characters and the lore behind WoW that was really interesting. So that's inspired us a lot. We've always, like, when we say we did fan fiction in the past, uh, not in the sense that we took other people's characters. That's always been one thing with us. We like creating our own characters. Uh, it was just for us in those early days of writing uh, where we were playing this game with other people, our friends, and, you know, we were role players from, like, you know, the tabletop sort of tradition of uh, acting at the role of our characters. Uh, the, the having a ready-made world to uh, engage in was the big 
draw. I mean, we love world building. We absolutely love creating our own worlds. But you know, we were already in this world, and we were playing with you know people we cared about and uh, role playing. So it it would just made such an awesome ready made thing for us. And plus, I mean, it it also came with kind of a built in community um, and readership. Uh, we started right. posting on Darkness Fantasy Erotica and back before we owned it. Yeah, back back in the day. Um, yeah. So we had a lot of people there who really responded well to uh, World of Warcraft, and they were playing the game, and they understood the world and stuff. So it kind of allowed us to focus more on character building, and I think that's why a lot of people really respond to our erotica is because we've really honed our ability to write characters and to write together and um, to really flesh our character plot lines out so now that we're introducing our own lore and our own backgrounds and settings and everything we already have the character stuff really solid so the world building and everything has um, come really easily because we don't have to worry about learning it all at once and we don't have to worry about practicing it all at once oh i mean come on every geeky nerd who's grown up with sci-fi and fantasy and video games has in their own mind at least practiced many a night will building their own fantasy and sci-fi worlds so yeah though uh that was something you know our early fan fiction days didn't give us a lot of practice with it was something you know from a writing before as teens and kids uh and in our own minds all along with something you know, we engaged in. So when we started writing the Forgotten Throne series, um, it really was something so amazing for us because there were so many more characters. Before, we used to focus pretty much on just like one-on-one character development. Sometimes there'd be like another character or two. But Forgotten Thrones really forced us out of our comfort zone, and it made us uh be able to manage more characters and how they interacted with the world a lot more seamlessly. Um for those of you not aware, like Forgotten Thrones was one of our it was our second release. Well, to be fair, we haven't released it all, we've just released kind of the introductory to it. Uh yeah, there is still so much, but because it's one of the older pieces, it's requiring a lot more work to bring it up to our current standards. Uh, it's a uh, fantasy, a light fantasy sort of uh, steampunk setting in a world thousands of years after a great war between good and evil ended and evil triumphed. So the main city, New Azov City, um, is pretty much a haven for debauchery. Uh, There is some order in as much as the vampire overlords think that there needs to be order for them to have Control. Control. And fodder for, you know, their feedings and their parties and all of the other twisted things that they're up to. So it's not actually really a vampire story. It doesn't focus very much on the overlords at all. Like, there are vampires in the story, obviously, but the main characters are more of the people that are just trying to live in this world that they have no real control over. Yeah, this is one thing you'll probably notice if you have been reading us for a while, is that we... We like to focus on, uh, I guess you could say, normal people, the you know the little people. Uh, we're not so big on uh, you know glamorizing the people on top so much as getting into the uh, the the down and dirty lives of the people who and have to make reality work. And I mean, not even um, just when we're writing normal everyday characters, but even in the Warlord's Concubine, which is our newest fantasy release, a newest um, novel. Novel. Uh, the main character is Morella, who is a handmaiden, but uh, the secondary character is the God King, and he is powerful, and he is in control, and he is. Um, everything that you'd imagine somebody to go by the name of God King to be. But there's so much more to him as well. He's not perfect. He's not all powerful. He's not um he's not glamorized. He he's still, you know, somebody that you can really empathize with. And that's really important for us. We can't 
bring ourselves to write stories about people who are so far beyond um, our, I guess, reality. Even in fantasy novels, we like for characters to be um, the grounding point. We like them to be the ones that you can empathize with, even if the world seems so strange and different. Uh, Warlord's Concubine, uh, like I said, our newest novel, but the uh, and it's been, we've been very pleased to say it's been getting a lot of good reviews from bloggers and and uh, our readers and fans. And uh, it's uh, very much a kind of culmination of Michelle and I's greatest sort of fantasies, desires, and our, our love of dark, gritty world with anti-heroes and blurry, gray lines of morality. And, you know, she said, Michelle said that, you know, main characters are Morella, the Handmaiden, and then the God King, but uh, it's also very much a story about uh, a sort of competition like uh, between her and the princess she worked for before the conquest, and there's a lot there. Uh, some of the viewers have noted that, you know, we take common tropes, these common themes, and we subvert them, and we we uh, there's some surprises in there. Uh, we don't, like a lot of uh, well, both readers and writers tend to look down on uh, using sort of common themes like tropes and whatnot. But we, we love it when we get a chance to subvert it, to do things a bit differently. And, you know, like I said, we're into, you know, dark fantasy. So, you know, Morella, uh, to follow a character like her who's so lowborn and to see how she rises or tries to rise from her station in life and, you know, to realize that to do something like that to go from being a lowly, middle-aged handmaiden to a pampered princess to some very dark, uh, dark decisions to make, and you know, but yes, a lot of uh, readers and writers uh, really have a, a strong aversion to tackling you know familiar themes and tropes. Uh, for us, we love it as long as there's an opportunity where we see we can. Uh, in our minds, creatively tackle a subversion of them, you know, taking these things and uh, turning them on their head a bit. And, you know, as writers of, you know, dark fantasy, sci-fi, and erotica, it's, uh, I think that gives us a very strong opportunity to do that. So uh, heavy on, like, character development as well. Like, it allows us to really uh, get at those kinds of themes. And for someone like Morella, who's a middle-aged, you know, uh, servant, to a pampered princess to try and rise up from her station in life in this sort of uh, uh, semi-medieval sort of setting, uh, this light fantasy world. Like you know, to to do that, it's going to require some very grim, dark decisions from her. And uh, you know, we hope that uh, people continue to enjoy that. Uh, we think that you know, it turn it. It's probably. One of my uh, proudest works that we've done. It's been such an amalgamation of uh, the things both Michelle and I love, not just in regards to that sort of literary snobbery, but uh, <laughs> but uh, in regards to kinks. It is very kinky. There's a lot of really um, sexy scenes and a lot of really uh, interesting scenes. We don't hold back in description yeah. of sex. It, do it doesn't matter, like... Uh, Warlord's Concubine is not erotica, uh, as we see it. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a full novel, and it's... it's the focus fair. isn't on the sex, it's on the story, but the sex is part of the story. Yes, yeah. And I mean, that's the type of stuff we enjoy writing anyways. Um, we do have a lot of short stuff out as well for when we just have an itch that we want to scratch. Right. Um, but we do enjoy having more story behind it. And I think it allows for more with regards to the characters as well, especially uh, creating really interesting, strong female characters. Um, I know there's a lot more coming out now. Uh, when I was growing up, there wasn't as many, um, especially in certain genres. Um, fantasy has always been pretty good. It's always had some female characters that were strong and interesting. And I think that's why with paranormal, paranormal romance and urban fantasy, um, it's really become something um, pretty incredible in regards to the amount of really strong female characters. But um, we don't really write 
paranormal romance very much. We don't really do the same style, and we don't really write in first person usually. So it it's more we're more interested in high fantasy and epic fantasies, and so that's what we write. And they've been pretty good with female characters as well. So. And not just like strong kick-ass characters, which you see a lot of in paranormal romance, but very cunning, um, very interesting and powerful women who don't just turn to violence at every point. Sometimes they will find ways around violence and find other alternatives. And I always think that's very interesting because some people still don't consider that when taking into account strong female characters. Um, they won't really um, agree that it's necessarily a kick-ass female if she's not physically kicking ass. So we always find it really interesting to have um, not just especially our female characters. Our male characters are very similar in that regard. But Well, strong characters in general. Yeah. yeah. Like, we write strong characters. And we write strong characters physically, emotionally, um, mentally. Uh, we like finding new ways for them to work through problems that isn't just kill everything that you see or, you know, fight your way out. Uh, as much as we love Buffy, you know, there were a few episodes that talked about how quickly they resort to violence and how, um, you know, sometimes they might not need to. So we like to explore that type of character and that type of uh, plot line as well. Right. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in uh, our thoughts on writing or just uh, encountering a lot of other awesome writers, like I mentioned earlier, there's our website. Uh, we uh, once were just humble posters there, and now we uh, own the site as darknestfantasyerotica.com. It's uh, not just for writers. Um, there's also a lot of role players, people who do, like, you know, D&D and also role play in MMORPGs, video games. Um, we have artists. Yeah, screen manipulations and photo manipulations are huge there, um, as well as traditional art, 2D art, 3D art. Like There is just so many yeah. amazing and talented people there in so many different ways. And people doing like kind of fan fiction stuff and doing original content. It's all sorts of, uh, you know, there's about a little bit of everything there and general chat boards as well. But uh, our, of course, favorite little corner is the, uh, the writer's board in the writer's corner. Where uh, we're often there pontificating at in great length about uh, uh, writing and publishing, and if uh, as well, of course, if you're interested in as well trying to get some of your own work published, uh, we have a uh, a thread there uh, where we're compiling information, trying to help other people uh, get into the business of uh, self-publishing their works. Being a writer can be very lonely at times. Uh, Josh and I are very lucky because we are able to write together and we love writing together. And that's, you know, what we did for fun before we started publishing. Like if, you know, all of a sudden everybody said no more indie publishers, we'd still be publishing. We'd still be putting it up on our website for people to enjoy because this is what we love and this is where our passion is. And Finding so many other people on Darknest who have the same passion, who have the same um, interest and desire to really share their work with people and get better and really right. make something special of themselves and their works for everybody else is just so amazing to um, to read and to have so much enthusiasm. Yeah, uh, it really helped us. I don't. I don't know if we would still be, well, we'd still be writing, I'm sure, today, but uh, I doubt we'd be selling it. We probably wouldn't have had the confidence darkness. in our work if uh, we hadn't had so much great feedback right when we first started and um, so many people who believed in us and our work and told us to keep going. Even when, like, real life came up or kept us from uh, posting updates to our uh, readers, you know, we'd get... A remark on darkness, someone, you know, bumping an old story we had posted there, like, years ago or something, and saying, like, God, like, you know, I haven't seen anything from you guys in a while, I love this stuff, I want to see something more. I mean, that sort of thing was so 
invigorating to us. I mean, you know, if you're not making money off your writing, all the more so. It's just it's the kind of thing that you know, just a writer feeds off of. And so that was great for us there. And uh, you know, anybody can go to post stories there, and uh, and it is private. Um, you are allowed under uh, the regulations for different. Um, not only just different uh, sites like KDP with Amazon for Kindle Direct Publishing and stuff, they don't allow you to post your stuff for free. However, because Darknest is behind a registration wall, um, not only does uh, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and those sites allow it, but traditional publishers allow it as well. If you post something behind a registration wall and... Um, you're posting it in order to get feedback and criticisms and comments, then they will consider that um, not to be your first publishing rights. So you can still sell that work. Because you register for Darkness does not mean there's any fee or anything. We don't, there's nothing. Darkness does run off of uh, the generosity of its members and donations and Michelle and I. And our wonderful host, Jason, who's just been fantastic since we uh, took it over in November. Yes, yeah, which we were happy to do when the former owners uh, could no longer handle uh, the size the, and the amount of time that goes into cultivating such a huge, a huge community yes, yeah. <laughs> with thousands, tens of thousands of members. Yeah. Over 100,000, 130,000 total. Yeah. Like I said, uh, you, you can go there to post your stories, read stories as well. We have a lot of readers. Uh, with 130,000 members, uh, it's a popular place to go to read. But uh, to help encourage you and get you thinking, if you're uh, looking to dabble into writing, we have uh, the monthly story challenges. They're not contests. You're not going to be judged as such. But uh, there'll be little prompts, like uh, this month, I believe. It has birthdays. to do... Birthdays. Yes, birthdays. This... Uh, month happens to be the uh, uh celebrate the birthday of uh both our writing board moderator tay and, and tay and michelle hey. and that was the inspiration for uh this month's challenge uh you can find more details about it there a little something that could get you thinking and get your creative juices flowing and you can write a little story to enter the challenge i actually had a story that i've been thinking about forever about like it's just contemporary, a little short about, you know, stripper turning 18 and going to, you know, well, becoming a stripper and then having her family meet her there, you know, because that's the way my brain works. So I figure, <laughs> hey, why just have a stripper? Why not have her brother stumble in and, you know, catch her there and see what happens then? Yeah, that's my show. <laughs> That's where my mind goes. So, <laughs> And for those of you, uh, of course, as we indicated, uh, a lot of uh, readers know us from Darkness and met us through there originally. Uh, for those of you familiar with it, uh, you know, there, we've got some new news and updates about what's been happening with the site uh, lately and what we're planning to do. As some of you may have noticed, the uh, what was formerly known as the uh, Screenshot Manipulations Boards is now just the Art Manipulations Board. And uh, we're welcoming over, for instance, a lot of our uh, our burgeoning uh, independent authors who uh, have been getting more and more skilled with uh, manipulations of uh, artwork for their covers, and for their book covers and that sort of thing. And you can uh, go there and hope, and, you know, Hopefully appreciate some of the work that they've put in as well, in addition to all the uh, other erotic work that's there uh, as well. Uh, in the works for some time now, uh, we're planning to, as a, a sort of heads up, uh, a update to uh, the Darkness Forum software. Uh, it's been delayed, but uh, we're assuring you all that... Uh, our lovely tech people, Jason, uh, working with Michelle, uh, plan to have a backup of the form. Like they're going to test it out on a new uh, sort of duplicate forum first to make sure everything works fine. So hopefully that'll happen sometime in the next month or so, um, and then it will make the forums a lot easier to post on and a lot nicer looking. I think. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, like Michelle mentioned earlier, uh, there's a section for like sort of personal ads for people who enjoy role play and that sort of tabletop tradition of acting out your characters, and uh, but in an online setting. Uh, I think our most popular section is probably for uh, our video game fans, which we can sympathize with back when we used to play World of Warcraft and mm-hmm. stuff. As I understand, you know, Neverwinter just came out, which is, you know, Dungeons & Dragons based and has been uh, very popular. So you can go check that out if you're interested at all. It's a great place to make friends. I mean, like, yeah. everything else aside, the people have been wonderful and it's so awesome to just be able to kick back and talk to other people who have similar interests and who um, both like adult and erotic content and also love video games and just kicking back and enjoying life. So. Right. Okay. With that, we move along to... Uh, questions? Yes. And our questions. Finest part, our final part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions. And uh, we'll be taking, you know, we'll be answering more questions in the future, both in regards to our writing and to darkness. Okay, so as some of you know, um, we went to Risque Sex Expo back yeah. in the beginning of May, uh, which was a local sex expo, obviously. Uh, we were asked to... Uh, be the keynote speakers. Yeah. And so we got to talk to everybody about fetishes and kinks and writing erotica, which was amazing. And I got to actually do two erotic readings. Um, so I read from Bound as the World Burns, which is our, um, well, apocalyptic BDSM interracial romance. Yeah. And uh, I read a bit from Amy's Innocence, which is one of our bestsellers, which is a kind of sweet little romance between a farm girl and a former military man who just meet. And so one of the big questions that we got both before and during the expo was, how do we write together? Um, we are one of the few couples out there that write together. So obviously a lot of people... For erotica, are, especially. Yes. So a lot of people have been really curious about how we, what our process is. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, both of us could fill any of the roles typically at any given time, though primarily uh, starts off, uh, one of us has an idea. I'm usually the idea person. He is the big idea person, usually. I have some, not as many as him. You're much busier than I am. She <laughs> still handles all of the uh, technical stuff that is way too complicated for my puny brain, so... Uh, that keeps her occupied, but you know, I'll, for for instance, in this case, I'll say oh, I come up with an idea. I uh, for like the warlord's concubine, he came up with the idea. So right, and then I'll build upon it. I'll uh, I'll tell her, and you know, usually then we'll bounce some more ideas off, and then uh, one of us, like in the case of the warlord's concubine, I then took what we had, uh, you know, the ideas that I had, I took it, uh, shaped it into a uh, plot. I wrote this out and detailed it into what needed to happen. Then, uh, when, when to start actually writing, I'm uh, referencing this you know, plot tree that I've created. I, you know, I begin by setting up the story, by setting up the, uh, the opening scene, and uh, you know, to, uh, on a very technical term, uh, basis to uh, we use Google Drive. It's a uh, it's word, amazing. It's a word processing program that's uh, all kind of done in the cloud. You know, it's all saved on Google servers. So but it allows us both to be writing in the same document at the same time, and we can see each other's updates live. Yeah, live. As you type, you're saying exactly what the other person is typing. It's, so it's a very, actually, like surprisingly complex word processor that, in my mind, just kind of trumps pretty much everything else out there, even the expensive paid stuff. A lot of people use it for role play as well because it's amazing. And now they have like a little chat feature in it, so it's gotten even better. Yeah, so I highly recommend that. Uh, so so uh, starting in there, uh, I set up the opening to Warlord's Concubine, the whole, I would set up the scene, the whole setting of the burning city below, the princess and the handmaiden there, the introduction of uh, uh, the god king come to conquer the place. And then uh, from there, Michelle sees what I've written. She goes in, makes changes. Uh, she helps create 
you know, the, the characters who uh, we've established beforehand as part of the plot building process. We discuss the characters and what we want them to be. So she starts adding to it and writing on, and I we go back and forth like that, basically. Uh, it's especially good for uh, the two of us with uh, writing dialogue. Because like, it becomes so natural. Um, I know when I'm writing by myself, it is so hard to do dialogue compared to when I'm writing with Josh. Because, like, it just has such a better flow to it. Right. It, it sounds a lot more natural. Um, we can get into the heads of, the, like, one character at a time for the yeah. most part. And just back and forth according to the uh, rhythm of the plot. And so, yeah, we continue with that, uh, uh, adhering to this structure we've come up with until basically we've written the story. And at that point, you know... Uh, uh, assuming, you know, everything goes smoothly. Sometimes, you know, you find that when you're writing a story, and this does, and this is not just two people working together. This is, you know, one person writing a story about themselves. Even you'll sometimes realize what you've gotten as you've actually written it out doesn't work with the plot you had intended. I have a tendency to throw Josh off a lot, too. Um, <laughs> I tend to sometimes interpret things differently. And so, like, my character will react in a way that he didn't anticipate. So, but uh, yeah, then we end up running with it, right? It's more natural that way. When, well, yeah. it could end up, you know, the whole plot's going to be thrown out. We're going to have to completely change it. But, you know, what we end up with then is better. Usually it um, makes more sense. Yeah. And not only that, but I mean, not everything in life is going to go as planned anyway. So right. it makes sense that sometimes things don't go as planned for our characters either. Right. And so, yeah, uh, you know, when that happens, you adapt to it. And like, like I said, it's not just when two people work together. Like, you know, written stories myself before, and if you were a writer, you undoubtedly you've done it too. Where you had my a plan. Character is different than I anticipated. <laughs> my favorite um, display of this was when we were writing *Fall Shades*, which is um, going to be released in June. It's uh, our noir mystery erotica. And, Set in the 1920s. Yeah, so I was playing, the, you know, the, the main character. Yeah, an upper class kind of uh, New England wasp character, and so Josh and I were talking about, okay, so what do we think that she's going to do this day? And I said, well, what day is it? And he said Sunday. I'm like, well, then obviously she'd be at church, and he just stared at me, and he's like. Because that just completely threw off every, um, you know, plot idea that he had. Because suddenly she's completely inaccessible for, you know, the entire length of the, you know, church period. So it just completely threw everything off. And um, it, it actually turned out, like, I think, really good. It, it, yeah. It was good to have her away for that period and in events transpired without her. Yeah, for that so period of time, and and that's what life is. Sometimes events happen and we're not there, so it right. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that uh, that story was a lot of fun, and uh, but yeah, once you get past that point, and once you've done, uh, then typically what we do is we take the story, we put it aside, and don't take a look at it now. For at least a month. Yeah. Uh, that's my rule. Uh, preferably, you know, way more than that. But sometimes it's a piece of work that, you know, you really want out. Or our readers are really excited for if it's a sequel to something. Mm. And you, we get excited and, though so, you know, we say, okay, well, a month then. That's been long enough. And we take it out. We edit it. Michelle and I pass it back and forth. Uh, I'll, I'll make a round of edits and go through it. Uh, She'll go through it proofread, you know. Now, luckily, like, because of the way we write, um, usually we can pick up on big errors right away. Because if suddenly, like, a guy is not wearing pants and he had his pants on two seconds ago and we <laughs> never detailed him taking his pants off, the other person can go, wait, this scene doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's usually taken care of in our writing process. So then, um, with that's our, a benefit to having two writers from yeah, the get go. With our editing, it's usually more proofreading and uh, checking for repetitive words and flow and everything. Right. Yeah. Which we're big on. We, uh, uh, I, I always loved that one person gave us a review, said that our writing had a certain poetry to it, and I guess it's not something. <laughs> 
yeah, it's not something we've ever thought about doing as long as I'm consciously trying to do, but we're very conscious of trying not to be repetitive, to uh, have a nice flow to things, and I, I guess that's just kind of how it worked out. So the next thing that a lot of our fans have been talking to us lately, and we've gotten a lot of uh, fan mail on, is our cock worship scenes. Um, we've done two that we have out already. Um, the first one is uh, Serving the Dark Demigod. Which is which, just a short little dirty piece. Yeah, it's only like, uh, I don't know, 4,000 words or something. So it's good for, you know, one quick session. And um, it's all about a goddess and a demon. And she is worshipping him. And worshipping his cock. And it's kind of a niche fetish, which is odd because you figure that it would be pretty huge especially in porn and it's actually really hard to find and a lot of women especially have been really enjoying it um so but a lot of people others don't understand what it is uh, yeah. what's the difference between you know a blowjob and cock worship yeah and, they just assume it's like the same thing but yeah if you're really the cock worship there's no comparison there's nothing like it like for me personally uh like, you know, in, whether it's in erotica or in, like, porn, uh, a blowjob scene doesn't really do anything for me. It's, you know, no titillation there. But, you know, cock worship, on the other hand, you know, it's quite arousing. So it kind of focuses on um, different... It has a different mood to it. It's not so much about trying to get your partner off or bring them to orgasm. It's more about... Um, taking time to worship your partner and to make them feel good and to um it, it's kind of tied in a little bit to subservience and just putting your partner before yourself and trying to bring right. them to such pleasurable heights without any need or desire for reciprocation. Right, yeah. I mean, we say cock worship, too, which is what we've done, but, I mean, it doesn't need to be about the cock. I mean, there's we've pussy worship. We've also done pussy worship. Um, yeah. A Night of the Arts is actually uh, definitely pussy worship. It's all oh, about true, yeah. um, a young man pleasing an older woman for in front of a crowd. And, yeah. I mean, it's the same theme. Yeah. Uh, there's no... Um, real desire to have your partner please you in return. It's just a gift that you're giving to them because they deserve it. They are worthy of it. Yeah. So that's the big draw for us on cock worship. Um, I actually wrote a blog post about it on One Handed Writers where I blog bi-weekly. And ever since then, I've just found it really fascinating. We have um, in the war in the Warlord's Concubine, which is our new fantasy novel, uh, we have a couple of scenes, I think, yeah. that are cock-worshipping. And we have a few Definitely. that we haven't released yet. Um, one is a post-apocalyptic sci-fi with two pregnant Asian women and a black man, which is totally sexy. Spoilers, God. Spoiler alert. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I won't tell you what book it is, so then it'll be a surprise when you read it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the main draw with uh, Cock Worship, and hopefully you guys will really check it out in the future, because it's awesome. I concur. <laughs> and so, our final question um, that we get a lot is if we'll be doing audiobooks. And unfortunately, right now, because we are Canadian, um, we are unable to sell audiobooks on Amazon and the other vendors. Um, they don't have an international agreement set up yet. So, um, anti Canadian discrimination. I know, it's terrible. <laughs> but when I, we were at the expo and I got to do the reading for uh, Bound as the World Burns you and really enjoyed that. Amy's Innocence, it was, uh, it was such a thrill. It was so amazing to see people um, respond so well to our story. And oh, it was yes. actually really easy to read. Our, yeah. Yeah. our books were like, they translated really well. And I think part of it is usually we edit by speaking it out aloud anyways. Yeah, it's part of our editing process, part of the many steps in our 
editing process. Yeah, so um, it has a really nice flow to it, and it was a lot of fun, and it was really sexy, and it was the way the audience responded was very different to the way they responded to um, us talking about fetishes and kinks. Like we're doing right now. Yeah, like we're doing right now. But when you're reading something sexy to a group, it's so much more personal, and it, it is such a different mood and atmosphere, and I want to do that. So in the future, um, I'm going to try to do some recordings um, and offer them up to our fans. I'm not sure how we'll be handling the technicalities right now. We've looked into several options. Yeah, so hopefully that'll be something that you can look forward to in the future. And if you have any suggestions or requests for what books you'd like for us to read, um, just send us an email at admin at jmkeep.com and let us know what you want to see because I so want to do this for you guys and I so want to make you happy with it. Yeah, or contact us on darkness. Part of this, this podcast, in fact, is our preliminary kind of research into audiobooks. You know, yep, try to work out what's best software and hardware wise for it. We actually found a Newfoundland company uh, that does our the recording software we're using now, Gold Wave. So I'm really hoping that they'll work out because I love supporting our local economy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's it for our first podcast. I hope you really enjoyed. Um, if there's anything you'd like to see for our next podcast or any topics you'd like for us to talk on, just Contact send us, us a message. Anywhere. We're on all of the social media websites. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and We don't spam with ads or anything. We just we try to only talk when we have something remotely interesting to say. Yeah, like, you know, what we had for supper or whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when our next bowel movement is planned for, yeah. Yeah, the you know, stuff. we kinda of go with the Sheldon approach there from Big Bang Theory. <laughs> so, um thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Uh, you can reach us at www.jmkeep.com or www.darknestfantasyerotica.com, and all of the links will be located below. Thanks so much. Bye. You're not going to see us, honey. This is all audio. Shh.